with the advent of social media and compounded by COVID-19 pandemic, when we could not get together, our executive luncheon has petered off and we no longer do it on a monthly basis. In the last year, the Chamber has made a concerted effort to reintroduce the luncheon program. And um, I hope some of you would recognize that for the last year, this is probably our fourth executive luncheon. And I look forward to your continued support and participation. Permit me to formally welcome all of you to this important and timely executive luncheon. The subject matter is of interest to all of us as business people and citizens. As has often been said, chaos loves a vacuum. And where there is insufficient, verifiable, trusted information from credible sources, speculation, rumor, misinformation, guessing, and deliberate false narrative flourish. Our executive luncheon seeks to provide a forum where verifiable information from a reliable source is provided to members of the business community. At the Chamber, we have received many calls from members and other concerned citizens regarding the veracity, significance, and potential impact of the claims and allegations surrounding the St. Lucia CIP program. This, in, this material has been dominating media reports in recent times. But as has been our practice, we have chosen not to make comment on the matter, but rather to engage the government so that we can better understand what the issues are, what are the risks, what are the issues that our business community and nation face, and also to get factual information that will allow us to guide and inform our members and work with the government and our nation at this crucial time. This is how we have and will continue to operate. It is important that as the oldest and most recognized national private sector institution that represents all sectors of the economy, we have members from services, micro, right up to the large multinational on all sectors as our membership. It's important that we conduct proper research, provide correct information to our members so that they and the chamber can speak and act authoritatively. Thus, I did what I have done to him on many an occasion. I called the minister of responsibility for the citizenship program and invited him to address the chamber, arguing that it was an opportunity for him to speak to the business community on the critical issues confronting the CIP program. And I wish to say that he gladly and quick, quickly accepted, should I say enthusiastically? <laughs> accepted the invitation to be here and to speak on this important issue. The chamber thanks the minister for his willingness to address our membership and what is clearly a sensitive issue. Um, let, me say, let, me, let me just tell you a little bit about our minister. Honorable Dr. Ernest Hille, as you would know, represents the Castries South constituency in the House of Assembly for the St. Lucia Labour Party and is currently the first deputy political leader of the St. Lucia Labour Party. He's also the Minister of Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information, and he is the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, Mr. Hillef, for some reason, didn't want to give me the exact dates, but in the early 90s, he completed his Bachelor of Science degree with first-class honors at the Cable Campus at the University of the West Indies. After serving one year as a Foreign Service Cadet, Hillef earned the Master's of Philosophy degree in 1995 with a distinction in international relations from Cambridge University, England. He later earned his PhD at the London School of Economics. He holds an executive diploma in negotiations and conflict resolution 
from Notre Dame University. Dr. Hillier has a wide range of experiences that span politics, sports, management, and diplomacy. Many of you will recall that he served as a personal assistant to Prime Minister Dr. Kenny Anthony in 1997, and in 1999 became permanent secretary in the Ministry of Youth and Sports. In 2005, he was given the responsibility of managing St. Lucia's hosting of ICC World Cup in 2007. His success in that endeavor led to his appointment as a tournament director for the ICC World, 2010, World 2020 in 2010. He also served as the Chief Executive Officer of the West Indies Cricket Board of Control. Mr. Hiller was appointed St. Lucia's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom in November 2012. He has chaired or led the setting up of numerous flagship projects in St. Lucia, including the CIP, NSDC, Bell Fund, Poverty Reduction, Poverty Reduction Fund, and Sports St. Lucia, Inc. Dr. Hiller was appointed Minister of Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture and Information in 2021 and has direct ministerial responsibility for the St. Lucia Citizenship by Investment Program. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Hiller to address the executive luncheon of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce on St. Lucia's Citizenship by Investment Program. Thank you very much, <coughs> Brian. Of course, let me recognize the President of the Chamber of Commerce and other directors, special invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be addressing you today, especially given recent developments in our CIP. You would have heard the severe criticism from the opposition for St. Lucia not signing the memorandum, the memorandum of agreement, the persistent showboating of one Felipe Martinez and his filing of a RICO case, you would have heard the opposition joining him and claiming that there is a CIP scandal, that over one billion US dollars is missing from CIP and that he less stole it, that we are facilitating underpricing by Galaxy and that I will soon be added to the RICO filing. I want to start by saying that there is a court case in relation to the RICO filing, and I will be constrained in the details that I can provide for obvious reasons. Also, it is not the style of this government, and certainly not mine, despite all that I have been through, to call out the names and details of persons especially who are not politicians, to highlight wrongdoing. Likewise, whatever our political persuasion, I don't think we should ever engage in any activity or conduct our business in any way that damages or destroys the reputation and image of our country. But today, I want to explain to you in detail how CIP works what we have done to make CIP resilient and sustainable, and I will respond to some of the accusations, all in the hope that you can make informed decisions thereafter. Ladies and gentlemen, let us start with an understanding of how a person can become a citizen of St. Lucia through the investment route. An applicant who applies to the unit will undergo the following processes. One, a complete documentation verification check to establish authenticity and validity of their documents. Second, a due diligence check by the bank which is processing their financial transactions, starting with their application and due diligence fees. Thirdly, a thorough due diligence check by a licensed agency. Fourthly, a law enforcement review. Fifth, an intelligence review by the GRCC based in Trinidad. Sixth, a financial review by the Financial Intelligence Unit. 
After all of that, seven, the unit then re reviews all reports, and if satisfactory, forwards to the board for final review and approval. The applicant, if approved, is then asked to provide the minimum investment amount. And when done, a certificate of registration of citizenship is signed by the minister. It is important that you remember that the applicant pays the minimum investment amount at the satisfactory completion of the entire process that I outlined. The above stated the process, but what are the options available for investment as of July 1st, 2024? One, the bond option. An applicant can choose to invest in a bond issue called the National Action Government Bond. The investment is US $300,000 and also pays a government fee of US $50,000. The bond must be held for five years and bears no interest. The money is paid to the unit and transferred to the Ministry of Finance. Second, the National Economic Fund. An applicant can choose to invest with a donation to the fund with a minimum of US $240,000 for a family of three and incremental increases according to the demographics of the family. There is no government fee. The money is paid to the unit and transferred to the National Economic Fund. Third, real estate. An applicant can choose to invest in an approved hotel or resort development at a minimum of US $300,000 plus administrative fees. The investment amount is paid to the developer and the administrative fee is paid to the unit. The investment amount belongs to the developer. Remember that the investment amount in the real estate is paid to the developer and belongs to the developer and must be used for all project costs, including construction, marketing and promotion, commissions, architectural and engineering expenses, and all other project costs. The, payment, the payments are held in escrow, and monthly statements are sent to the unit to establish that the minimum investment is being paid for each applicant. The applicant holds a share interest in the development and can resell the interest after five years. And the fourth option, enterprise. There are three sub-options under the enterprise. Firstly, where an applicant invests at least US $3.5 million as a single investor. Secondly, where a joint venture of at least six applicants invests US $6 million. And thirdly, where an applicant invests US $240,000 for a family of three in an approved project. There is an approved list of investment areas for the enterprise option. I will return to the enterprise option later. Having explained how one can become a citizen through investment, let us examine the thinking behind the establishment of the program and what has changed since. After reviewing the industry landscape in 2015, St. Lucia was of the view that any program must be built on a robust and rigid due diligence foundation. It is for that reason that we built a due diligence capability which is fit for purpose. I am also pleased that since July 2021, St. Lucia has taken further steps to strengthen its capabilities, including a bank financial review and the FIU review. Sometimes we are criticized for taking too long for approvals, but we are convinced that we must do so. Whatever we, we must do whatever we can to ensure that our approvals are based on the most rigorous examination. In 2016, we were also of the view that the program should never be presented as a transactional, but rather as an interactional engagement. A transactional approach would simply reinforce the view 
that we were just selling passports. Instead, we felt we should present the industry as securing investments through citizenships. We still do not believe that we should be seen as selling passports, and we do not sell passports. Part of the negative perception of this industry is derived from the language used by its stakeholders. When we opened offices in January 2016, we employed a citizen's relationship officer whose duty was to contact every new citizen and outline a program of engagement to build a sense of belonging and connectedness to St. Lucia. We felt that new citizens should be aware of the history of and knowledgeable of the happenings in St. Lucia. We described this approach as beyond the passport. I recall someone from the opposition taunted me that people did not have time for that. People just wanted a passport. With a change of direction in June 2016, this was removed as a feature. Why was there such a change in direction? Well, the new government then felt that we needed to be more like the other offerings in the region and remove the beyond the passport concept. We also felt in 2016 that the structure of the program should make it highly selective and manage to allow only the most attractive persons to apply and become citizens. We did not believe that the program should be about numbers and we should have to rush to earn as much as possible and as quickly as possible. We felt that that was just not sustainable. So, what did we provide in the legislation and regulations of October 2015? One, that the minimum investment level should be through donation and at US 200,000K. Two, that there should be an annual quota of 500 applications. Three, that the principal applicants must have a net worth of US $3 million. Four, the list of all persons approved and rejected would be published. Five, that escrow accounts must be held locally. Six, that all appointed service providers, marketing agents, promoters, authorized agents, etc., must be licensed and gazetted. In the case of authorized agents, agents had to be St. Lucian and locally based. Seven, annual reports of the functioning of the unit including financial statements, had to be tabled in Parliament. Eight, and that one is important, that no commissions were paid to any promoter or agent. I want to come back to the issue of paying commissions, as I believe this is creating a major challenge for us. I'm stating these provisions to highlight the extent to which we had provided for a resilient and sustainable program. All these provisions except one was sadly removed in the change of direction which took place in 2016. Again, it was felt then, rightfully or wrongfully, that St. Lucia had to change to be aligned with other countries. Noting the above, you can see why St. Lucia had no problems with the provisions of the memorandum of agreement, except for the change in pricing. We had hoped for a grandfather clause to allow us to fulfill our contracts and still be able to sign, yet we are chastised for not signing. We believe then that our first obligation is to protect the best interests of St. Lucia. We could not expose our country to litigation or take decisions which would jeopardize our financial position or our developmental agenda. Despite what you've heard repeatedly from the opposition and Martinez, we have a proud record of managing our CIP. We have implemented every recommendation from international partners, the US, the EU, and the UK. We have not been cited for any failing or operational deficiency, and no other country can say the same. The only recommendation, only recommendation which was outstanding, which will soon be addressed, and shortly we will announce the name of the international firm which will undertake the audit of the operations of the unit. The opposition missed a golden opportunity to show national and collective responsibility 
when they initiated the criticism of the government for not signing the MOA immediately. This is a highly competitive industry, and whereas we may disagree on approaches, we should never show national disunity on fundamental issues, especially when the disagreement is not based on facts, but rather political convenience. Such political opportunism was further manifested in the Martinez-Rico case, as Martinez admitted that he got information from the opposition. So allow me to now address the Martinez-Rico case. I want to provide a simple analogy to understand, for you to understand what faces us. Can you imagine someone asking you to act against a partner or else you'll be made to pay? Or that you act against someone in your workplace who you have no issue with and failing to do so will result in shaming you? Our position has been a simple one. If Martinez has an issue with Galaxy and persons in St. Kitts, then he should proceed to the courts in St. Kitts to settle the matter. That is how we deal with issues in our part of the world. I cannot be expected as minister to agree to act against Galaxy simply because Martinez has asked us to do so. It would be grossly irresponsible. If we should, then what happens to the completion of the Canals Resort Development Project? Who would be responsible for the lawsuits and other litigation we would face from applicants and Galaxy? And why would we want to act against a company that we have no issue with? Does anyone believe that Martinez loves St. Lucia, that he cares about us, and that he's doing this for our benefit? How does someone sue a company for damages and loss, but spend more time on talk shows and showboating and exposing anyone he's had private conversations with? How does bullying and threatening staff and board members of the CIP and other institutions show sincerity on the part of Felipe? As minister, it is my responsibility to defend the CIP and the best interests of this country. If it means that Martinez will come after me, then so be it. What is worse about this Martinez affair is that the opposition has joined with him to condemn the CIP unit, its staff and directors, accuse and attack me, and undermine the reputation of St. Lucia. Martinez has publicly said or implied that he has received information from the opposition. They echo each other and share similar song bites. Now, why would the opposition seek to burn down our country to the ground in favor of an unknown and questionable character? Tell me. First, the opposition launched a sustained campaign lobbying for St. Lucia to lose its visa-free access to the UK and the EU. They had it all over that St. Lucia about to lose its access. It has not happened. Today, it is a sustained campaign for St. Lucia to lose its correspondent banking relationships. Now, why would you want your country to lose such a critical ingredient for the sustenance of its economy and the livelihood of its people? This is, in my view, treasonous. Why is the opposition in league with Martinez? It cannot be that they don't believe in Galaxy. The truth is that Galaxy was brought to St. Lucia by the Alan Chastney administration. The former prime minister gave a resounding endorsement of Galaxy, including assisting them in securing the hotel management contract with AM Resorts. Galaxy also received a strong endorsement from the former minister of commerce. Here is the endorsement of the opposition when in government. Caribbean, and I quote, Caribbean Galaxy Real Estate is a citizenship by investment client, and they were screened through rigorous processes. CIP ensured that the company met all requirements of transparency and had a proven track record of doing ethical business throughout the region and internationally as well. That was their endorsement of Galaxy. Today, Support has been given to Martinez to vilify and desecrate Galaxy because it has become politically convenient. So what does, Ga what does Martinez claim that St. Lucia has done wrong? And I want you to listen carefully. He claims that St. Lucia has aided Galaxy 
by giving them significant shares, which allowed Galaxy to sell below stated prices. In so doing, it affected his capacity to sell shares in his hotel projects. Let us examine the accusation. We believe that our legislation is very clear. For an individual to qualify for citizenship, that person must complete the due diligence processes successfully and must pay all applicable fees, including the minimum investment amount. That's what our law says. We believe that once those requirements are met, then we have done nothing wrong. In any event, let's look at the practices which are described as illegal. But first, I want to categorically state that the unit does not get involved in the marketing or sales strategies of any promoter or developer. Our position is clear. We don't get involved in private commercial agreements between parties. However, we don't encourage or condone any marketing or sale of shares below the stated price. Once it was brought to the attention of the unit that there were agents promoting citizenships below the stated minimum investment level for St. Lucia and other countries, the unit sent out a memo to all promoters, developers, and agents stating the unit's disapproval of the practice. But again, we cannot regulate commercial agreements between parties or the actions of any entity in a foreign jurisdiction. However, these practices are a persistent feature of the industry, whether they are called underpricing, rebates, discounting, financing, or buyback. Our lawyers have reviewed this and have advised us that none of the above practices are contrary to our law or our CIP legislation. Also, the former prime minister is on record as saying that he had received reports about these practices by Galaxy and had asked that it be investigated. He further stated that he was told that nothing wrong was being done. Yet today he joins Martinez to condemn St. Lucia as aiding and abetting Galaxy. I need to return to the issue of commissions. I spoke earlier of the 2016 initiation of the CIP and noted that the unit did not provide commissions. This was introduced after the change of government in 2016. The unit decided to withhold 20% of the minimum investment for the donation option and pay it back to the agents, promoters, or marketing agents. I'm avoiding greater details and I'm not sure whether this will become a legal matter. But consider this, this is not a developer or promoter providing a commission. It is the unit itself providing it. I wish I could tell you who the local agents were who started receiving those commissions. I also wish I could tell you which local agent was the largest agent acting on behalf of Galaxy when they started operating in St. Lucia. But that's for another day. It is certainly not the names that Martinez and the opposition are shouting right now. Let me give you an example to illustrate how commissions can be used. Imagine a residential apartment developer offering 10% commission on the sale of apartments, each one costing $1 million. It means that the agent would get 100,000 K, 10% of 1 million. Then imagine a real estate agent offering a potential buyer for an apartment, offering a potential buyer the apartment for 950K as he shares his 100,000 commission 50-50. So in effect, the buyer only pays 950K, he gets back 50,000. It means that although the stated price is 1 million, the actual purchase price is 950K because that person gets back 50K as half of the, the agent's 100,000K. But then think about it. If the commission was 20% or 200,000K, 
then the actual purchase price can become 900,000 K because he shares 200,000, 100, 100. It does not take much for an agent to advertise the sale of that apartment, not as 1 million, but for 950K, or even 900K, or even lower if his commission goes higher. I want you to understand through this example how commissions can determine the final sale price in an industry which is commission driven. But also significantly, as developers start to compete on levels of commission to bring in sales, it is easy to get a situation where commission levels rise out of control. So imagine in 2018, the unit itself offered commissions of 20%. So guess what developers who are way more aggressive in the sales strategy would be offering right now? We now have an industry where if you want to drive your sales, then offer the highest commission. I'm sure you can find many other examples of creative sales and marketing strategies used to drive sales. I want to respond to the repeated claim made by Martinez and the opposition that there is a CIP scandal and that more than $1 billion is missing and should be returned to St. Lucia. You would recall that I explained that in the real estate option, the minimum investment amount is paid and belongs to the developer. This money is never that of the state and cannot be claimed as such. What belongs to the state is the administrative fees that are paid. So the claim by Martinez and the opposition is that Galaxy got 6,000 shares and at 200,000 K minimum investment, then that's 1.2 billion and that money should belong to the government and not the developer. This is wrong on all counts. Further, the minimum investment amount is paid when an applicant has completed the entire process and is approved. I can state that at the present rate of approval, it will take quite a while for the full allocation of shares to be approved and the developer able to collect their revenue through the sale of their shares. It means that the developer will have to secure private financing upfront, which will be recovered as approvals are granted. I also want you to note that given the intense competition between competitors in the various islands, there is a steady rise in commissions being offered, resulting in commissions becoming a significant project cost and eventually leading to demands for more shares. I wish I could share with you what some developers in other islands have been given. St. Lucia has been and remains very conservative. The opposition must be very careful how it speaks of CIP scandals. We believe that we must always act in a manner that puts St. Lucia and St. Lucians first. We want our country's reputation to be that of a jurisdiction that has respect for its laws and the privacy of commercial agreements. We want a reputation of a country that is a prime jurisdiction for investments and that the decisions of governments are honored. It is, why in, it is why in every instance, when we disagreed with the decisions of the last government, we stated why and offered alternative approaches. And when in government, we have respectfully and privately held discussions with relevant investors to express our positions and seek alignment with our philosophical and developmental approach. We did not scream corruption and accuse any and everyone although for sure we shouted when we disagreed. The accusation that the minimum investment that is to be paid to Galaxy is missing is deliberately misleading, as I have explained. If it is that $1.2 billion is missing, consider this. DSH applied for CIP approval for a project estimated at $1.8 billion US dollars. In their proposal, which I have a copy of, they requested 9,160 shares. 9,160 shares. Now multiply this by 300,000 US. That gives $2.7 billion. I am told that the CEO at that time was removed from office because she did not recommend approval of the application of DSH. 
the requirement to allow CIP escrow accounts to be held in St. Lucia was changed to accommodate DSH. Yet there is no record anywhere of any approval being given to DSH. There is no record of any escrow agreement or any CIP agreement with DSH. Yet there was placed on the CIP website, and it is still there, the announcement and placement of the Alpina and Lucia Hotel and Alpina Square as two CIP approved projects. You can visit the website now. Scroll to the bottom and click on Get an Investment Approved. You can even see the date that it was announced to the world on the website, January 11, 2021. Now, does that mean that the 2.7 billion US dollars is missing? Does that mean that the then minister is corrupt and stole the money? You tell me. It is also shocking to hear Martinez and the opposition speak of scandal in respect of the use of a Chinese due diligence firm. But guess who engaged such a firm in St. Lucia? Guess who? And guess under which administration the engagement of the firm was terminated? Just guess. And I'm sure you will guess right. Now, if you want to speak of scandal in the CIP, you must speak of the range development. The range development was approved by the Kenya Antony administration and a share allocation given for real estate at 300,000K. The government changed. Therefore, any further announcement, no further announcement, or even a single application was received. After the change in 2016, the agreement was amended. There was no legislative or regulation change, but the developer was allowed to sell their allotted shares in the development as donations. I, I still can't understand how that can, that can happen. And for all monies to be placed in an escrow account and to be loaned to the developer. So it meant that the monies from donations were never meant to be in the National Economic Fund and that the minimum investment for real estate share to qualify for citizenship was never paid. But it gets worse. Something went wrong. I don't know. And the developer sued St. Lucia. A developer with a proven track record and who always delivers. We cannot find any records anywhere. But apparently there was a settlement and monies were reimbursed to the developer. We have no idea how much was placed in the supposed escrow account or where it can be found. We don't know exactly how much was paid to the developer and for what, since no hotel was built and yet citizenships were granted. I can provide a couple of other matters which would shock you, but I think I have made my point that people must be careful when they speak about scandals. Let me return to the enterprise option. The opposition has been raising issue with the so-called infrastructure option and what they claim is corruption. Not that they disagree with, the, with an infrastructure option and that they have a brighter idea. Instead, it is just seen as corruption. Sometimes I wonder then, if all the projects under the last administration were instances of corruption. But again, that's for another time. Under the enterprise option, we added a third sub-option, which allows a developer to propose a self-finance project in one of the investment areas in exchange for an agreed number of qualifying applications, similar to shares in the real estate. The developer must source the finance and spend up front and carries all the risk, has the responsibility of sourcing the applicants, carries the risk of sale, and even if there is termination of the program, they must carry the risk and they must implement the project under the supervision of the government of St. Lucia. Since its announcement, we have been able to secure investment in a national infrastructure improvement project, a housing project, and have a pending application for another housing project. The opposition has cried foul. They claim that the option is illegal. I'm not sure how it is illegal. The changes were gazetted on December 20th, 2023. As per legislation, 
the opposition could have tabled a resolution in Parliament to oppose the changes. They never did. You see, when the leader of the opposition doesn't turn up in Parliament to do the people's work or just keeps walking out, he'll always be caught trying to catch up. The opposition is frightened of the success of the new enterprise option. This option has the potential to open significant avenues for investment in constructing roads and highways, upgrading educational institutions, housing and medical facilities. I can state categorically that though applications have been received, no application has been approved and administrative arrangements are still both, are being put in place for this option. So the actions of Martinez and the opposition is clearly political and designed to destroy the St. Lucian CIP. If you have any doubts about this, listen to the leader of the opposition. He says he agrees with Martinez. Then he goes on further, and I want to quote him. Mr. Martinez is offering the governments of the Caribbean to join him in a class action suit against the banks to recover the money from our countries. When he's invited all the governments to come up, it is to get the evidence for that. So when you see that there are governments who don't want to go, it's either that they're arrogant and don't care about our money, or they are part of the problem. Now I believe that we should write Mr. Martinez and to say to him that if in fact the government does not want to join him, the people of St. Lucia will join. And so I'm going to ask my party at its next meeting to approve the beginning of a petition in St. Lucia that we may accumulate as many names as possible to send it to Mr. Martinez and to tell him that we want our money back and to ask him whether he will pay the legal fees to assist us in going after our money and to make sure our money comes back from China here to St. Lucia. Why would you want to sue the American banks? The banks? To destroy our correspondent banking relationships? To destroy our economy? When it was the leader of the opposition and administration that established the escrow account in China in the first place. As the saying goes, and it applies in this case, the leader of opposition is desperate on a good day and dangerous on a bad day. You may ask me why. It is plain and simple. For, for Martinez, it is the action of a person who is selfish and focused on his benefit, regardless of who gets hurt or affected. For, forget all the showboating and newly found love for St. Lucia and St. Lucians. This is a fraud. For the opposition, it is highly opportunistic behavior with the hope that they can hurt the government, the prime minister, and their favorite target, Ernest Hillier. For them, it's their pathway to returning to governing the country. Having said this, let me end on a personal note. I have been the subject of the most vicious and malicious attacks from the opposition leader and his surrogates since I entered politics. Their plan is clear. My image must be so vilified and my reputation so tarnished that I will not be a political force in St. Lucia. And of course, the party and government will be affected. I have not been broken by these attacks and accusations. The last government asked the UK authorities to investigate me for stealing a vehicle which I bought with my own money. They foolishly made a formal request to the US authorities who asked Gmail to provide all my emails to see if I had done something wrong in my life. They wrote every known bank to find out if I had any foreign accounts. Police sought a warrant to search my house. And finally, customs seized the same vehicle on grounds, not that it was not mine, but that the delivery invoice was not in my name, and then charged me for not having the invoice. I won the case and had the former controller of customs apologize to me in exchange for dropping a lawsuit against him for his wrongful action. Yet he is still out there mouthing and accusing me. Now, Martinez promises to add my name to his RICO filing on August 30th and promises to wipe the smile off my face. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint him. I'm guided by the truth and knowing that I've done nothing wrong. I'm also not aware that the unit has done anything wrong. I'm proud to serve in this government. I'm smiling every day because I see the successes in tourism arrivals of jazz, of carnival, of the increased investments in the country, of celebrations of emancipation, La Rose, La Margaret, and Creole Heritage Month. 
I see the successes in my constituency with so much still to be done. I love my job and I give it my best. I know no other way. Thank you very much.